We are reaching a time where most of the people that played Elden Ring already finished it. Yeah, I'm moving on to other stuff. I have been asked several times if it's worth playing the previous Souls titles. Now I will try to give you an answer. What's up, you damn gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful gamers? So welcome back, Rolf Wayne James, to this Mario Corner in the internet where we like to discuss about RPGs. If you like the content, if you like to have these conversations with Mario James, I would very much like to invite you, like always, hit that like button, it really helps me like you have no idea. Subscribe to the channel for more things RPGs. Let's make a brief disclaimer before we start the review. This will be divided in different sections. I normally break down games and technical quality aspects to you. However, since this is not a release, most of the people are wondering if they should try the previous Souls games once they finished Elden Ring. I will add some comments that will give you a little bit more insight that you actually do need. So graphics come at first. How well has Dark Souls aged? It will definitely look squared and polygons, wise you are indeed going to see that legoness, <laughs> especially on coastal areas. The texture side though, they are masterfully handled, especially for a 2011 title. If you get away and not look point blank on the stones of buildings, there is indeed some kind of effect that seems to trick your eye, leading you to believe that those edges and protuberances on the wall are indeed edges and protuberances on the wall, not polygons. They are not. They are just them well-crafted textures. That is also true for gear and armor. Whether you play the remastered version or not, the illumination, for its time, is gorgeous as well. The Axels has this depraved, depressing vibe to it. Even on the most illuminated areas, you cannot help but feel that it is really a damn depressing world. And that is one of the biggest hits of those games. The world. Dark Souls is not an open world, although it is still seamlessly connected. And I believe that, graphics and art direction-wise, it is one of the reasons why many of us fell in love with it to begin with. It is not an open world, yet every time you see something that looks somewhat appealing or nice in the distance, you are likely going to get there. And the connection that leads you there, it always makes sense. You do feel like you're stranded in this world. And it's so alluring that you're always wondering what happened. And that is one of the aspects of the narrative, but we will discuss about that later on. Another thing that is only to be commended, if not praiseable, is the masterful use of drawing and building techniques they used. Logically, it would be too much resource consuming to craft the models of the places that you're going to visit in the distance. Instead, they are paintings, sometimes attached to the skyboxes. But they do not look artificial at all. You can stare at them, and eventually you will realize that they are indeed paintings. But it feels so artistic, and knowing that you will definitely going to get to that place eventually makes you anxious to know how it is going to look up close. And trust me, they never disappoint. Again, even for a 2011, there are some locations in this game that are downright jaw-dropping, gorgeous and beautiful. If you ultimately decide to play the game for yourself, know that, as you progress, if you stay on the path and take the challenge, the game is just going to get darker and beautiful as you go. Now let's move on to sound.
have here? You must be a new arrival. Let me guess. Fate of the undead, right? Well, you're not the first. But there's no salvation here. You'd have done better to rot in the undead asylum. But too late now. <sighs> well, since you're here, let me help you out. There are actually two bells of awakening. One's up above in the undead church. The other is far, far below in the ruins at the base of Blight. I just love how this goes hand in hand with the overall vibe that the game is trying to build around you as a player while you explore. Sometimes the game will be dull, silent, and all that you're going to hear is the ominous wind as you move closer, panting. Yes, of the creatures and enemies that await you in the distance, in the corridors, the corners of every place you visit. Something terrible happens to this world. The idea is to remind you at all times that such thing has indeed happened. The idea is to make you feel desolate, desperate, or where. With your shield up, you are going to hear the footsteps of your character, the heavy armor waiting on you as it waits your breath, and it will. Because there is always danger. There is no music, because you need to appreciate how empty the world feels. And this is a bold move, really. Many a time, developers like to compose remarkable soundtracks to pump up those music levels and make you forget about scenery sounds. It is definitely harder to accomplish an atmosphere with all of the micromanaging of the sounds that has to happen in the games and not making it feel like a modern Prometheus of sound. The sound of the world, the clashes of steel that runs on the flesh, everything is damn precise, gorgeous and well made. And that is not to say that the soundtrack is bad. In fact, I believe the Dark Souls series holds some of my favorite music of all time. The theme that you are listening right now is called Nameless Song. It is one of my favorite Dark Souls series theme. The music fits perfectly the personality of these games. When you are fighting a boss fight, tremendous clashes of percussion and ire of chords is going to produce such a remarkable battle music that wishes to make you believe not in courage, but in, but in danger. We will get to narrative later, but there are other boss fights that have music specific to their tone. When you fight against them, you might not pay that much attention, but then, later, when you learn the story, it comes back as a flashback. And suddenly you realize that those terrible monsters that you are fighting have a real deep background. And you cannot help but wonder who the true villain in this story is, so let us talk about that. You are in Lodran. You wake up in a cell, undead, with no real reason as to who you are and why you are there. There is no villain, there is no reason, you simply move, forward and unbending. For if you stop, you hollow. You lose your mind, sanity, and every part of who you once were. That is everything that you need to know about the story. Most of the people see it not being able to palpate an antagonist from the very early stages of the story as a bad thing. But it is not the case. Worlds are made, stories are written, the cosmology of the Axles is a mixture between many Eastern and Western mythologies, as well as sources like Berserk. Much like everything else in this world, you are thrown in here, and no one will tell you directly anything. But if you decide to indeed play the game, please do me a great favor. Take a look at your surroundings. When you pick up a weapon, immerse yourself in it. Where was it? Probably on a corpse. And by the position and enemies around the corpse, that is where that warrior left his sanity. The hollows lose their will with every death. When you lose purpose, that is when you truly die. Keep meaning to that weapon. It was recovered from a place where a soul truly left a body. The items you recover from the world are specifically positioned there so that you can then start to learn how about the stories are uh, really important characters in this world. They are really important. This is indeed what divides the community at some extent. There are people that like to see a story told directly forward to them, and there are those who don't. Know that it is all text, and everything that you see in this world can be interpreted. From my perspective, learning about Knight Artorias that fought the Abyss to, get some, to give some more hope to the good people of Lodran before the fall. 
Quellag that haunts humanity from those still with it, only so that she could ease her sister's pain. These are truly worth knowing stories. When you enter this world, you truly feel like in an RPG, you immerse and you lose yourself in it. Now let us get to, to the juicy, the gameplay. Is it really a hard game? The answer is rather subjective. I cannot tell you that it is down straight hard, because it is not the answer. I will not discuss all of the game's mechanics in this review because that is not the purpose of this video. All I will say is that they are complicated, and that the game will never explain them to you, not in tutorials, not in anywhere. You might argue that that is a bit unfair, but think back again. The whole purpose of the game is to throw you in a world where you have to discover your path by trial and error, and by struggling just like a normal person. A world that is dangerous indeed. You are no longer a superhero, you are a person. There are many persons out there trying to do the same thing as you, and if you decide to quit the game out of lack of will, you are still playing because of one of the game's mechanics. You became hollow. One of those fallen warriors, forever to wander Lodran, hunting those who do not falter. So let us then speak about artificial difficulty, because the game does not have such thing. Artificial difficulty is when games give you an option on difficulty, which mostly means that in most cases, enemies are just going to turn into damage sponges that increase the damage they deal to you as well. That is not the case for Dark Souls. You see, most of the games out there, it is all about clicking a button. Something happens when you click that button. Let us discuss about one of Dark Souls' biggest release competitors. Skyrim. Do not get me wrong, I love Skyrim, I have played thousands of hours of it, and I have also bought every single damn re-release of the game, and I am not ashamed of it for that matter. <laughs> that said, I think that we all can agree that with Skyrim, the complete deadness of the combat system sums up in, you click and you do something, and then you keep clicking until something dies. Depending on your build or weapon, things die faster or slower on your clicks. Axles introduce complex controls and mechanics, where your actions have to match the hitboxes, opening, attacks patterns of the enemies. For big and small, it is like a dance, hit too early, and if the enemy is faster, he is likely going to interrupt you and attack. And if you don't have heavy armor that can withstand the blow, which is dictated by poise, another game's mechanic, as I elaborate this, and hopefully you fo you're following me, you start to realize how it really is not that harder. It is just complex and thoughtful. You need to master the game's mechanics to use them in your advantage. Opposite to most of the games out there, which is just click and kill, rinse and repeat. This degree of complexity left from software to build complex scenarios that can be overcome with different st strategies are you stuck in a corner in front of an enemy with a shield up and your weapon keeps bouncing on a wall, then thrust attack. Your surroundings are much your enemies as they are your allies, if you use them properly. Now compared to Elden Ring, there are indeed some things that you need to have in mind. Dark Souls does not have omnidirectional rolling. You can only dodge in four directions. Sideways, front and back. Weapons are not as flashy outside from Artorias of the Abyss DLC, which is where the first weapon arts started to appear. Then they evolved evenly from Dark Souls 2 to the point of Elden Ring. Elden Ring opens up a whole world of possibilities with skills, weapon arts and whatnot. Dark Souls is more primitive. It is a game where you have to fight bosses on the same odds. You do not have special overpowered skills. You have a boss. You have a pattern and the ability to fight it a thousand times until you learn those patterns and how to defeat the boss. Unlike Elden Ring, not always will you be in front of the boss each time he defeats you. Sometimes you will be far away from the bonfire, which are checkpoints of the game, and uh, all of the enemies will be back. Yeah. So you are going to need to learn how to defeat them faster or completely avoid them, which ends up becoming a part of resource management to have as much flasks when you get to the bosses. If you think about it, you could say it is a hard game, but in reality it's just a complex game that becomes more approachable the more you learn the game's mechanics. 
Luckily for you, it is a 2011 game and most of the stuff you need to know for it is already posted on YouTube. The guides side made prior to Elden Ring's release date were based on Souls formula, so if you haven't watched them, you should. You will have an easy time and Elden Ring has already prepared you at some extent for the journey, so yes, I believe that if you have not played Dark Souls and still you decided to play Elden Ring, this is just the perfect time to start this beautiful journey that will ruin gaming for you, <laughs> because once you are done, and once you have washed and tempered your gaming self in the fires of the Axles, there will be little to none game out there that will give you the same satisfaction and sense of accomplishment that the Souls series gives. So I hope that if you like the video, if you will find the video informative, you would very much like to spare me a like. It really helps me like you have no idea. We discuss about RPGs in here and if you're not subscribed to the channel, then please subscribe to the channel. Let me know if you're actually planning on trying Dark Souls in the comments below. And I'll be seeing you them gorgeous and beautiful people in the next one. Have a beautiful day and remember that, again, if no one has told you today that you're a gorgeous and beautiful person, you are indeed a gorgeous and beautiful person. Stay safe out there and I'll be seeing you guys in the next one. Goodbye.